In this episode of Table Talk, we're going to be discussing the 2019 National Mahjong League card. If you don't see the word live in the corner of the video, you're watching the repost. If you have any questions, write them in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Me and the community, this is a team effort. Let's go live. Cross your fingers. I've been having technical difficulties here. Stream complete. Why is it saying stream? Oh, there we go. It's connecting. Okay, live, we're live. Now, let's see if we can get some. Let's see how this goes. Okay, now. Oh, here we go. Just got the little notification. Sitting there saying they can't connect. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, can you see me sitting at my desk? Because for some reason, let's see. I'm going to reload this here. I don't understand what's going on. I've got gremlins. Oh, there we go. All right, I think we finally got it. Oh, my goodness. Okay, yeah, that was a little stressful. I just need to breathe for a minute. Okay, welcome. Welcome to the live stream, everybody. Hi, Ruth, Katie, Sharon, Cindy, hi. Patricia, we have Jerry, Sharon, D. Turner is here, and Laura. Did I already say hi to Katie? All right, we got it now. All right, I do not know what happened there. Oh, my goodness. Gremlins. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the live stream. So sorry for the delay. That was a bit crazy. I'm still kind of a noob when it comes to YouTube live streaming and really YouTube in general and Facebook. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it was me. <clears throat> okay. Does anybody know where that's from? It was me. Okay, let me just check out Facebook and see if anybody else is having trouble here. Okay, click to launch. I think we've got it now. Above link now working, now working in. Okay, I think we've got it now. Okay. Oh, no worries. I'm just glad it worked out here. So, all right. Well, let's get started. Since we're, you know, kind of starting 15 minutes late, we'll take it 15 minutes after. We'll just go an hour. So 15 minutes after 8. We'll see if we can get everything in. If not, we can go long and people can come and go as need be. So, uh, hi, Marnie. <laughs> Welcome. So sorry about that goose chase. All right. Uh, hi, Laura. Another Laura in the room. Okay, so ha did anybody um, have any questions about the l launch video and the findings that I published? If you didn't download that and take a look at it, there's a link for it in the video description below. So you can download it and follow along. We may or may not go over any of these things. But these were just some things that I thought were interesting and could help me as a player sort of ramp up with the new card. And it may, may or not be helpful for everybody, but I sure found some of these things interesting. Hi, Irene. Welcome, Donna. So... 
If you haven't downloaded the findings, look for a link in the video description below. And then if you haven't seen the video, you might want to watch that too because I kind of talk through it and maybe explain some things, um, some background information on where I came up with these ideas. So over the last two weeks, two to three weeks now, really, because most people got their card at the end of, it, you know, the first weekend in April. And let's see here, the first weekend in April was would have been Friday the 5th, but I got my card on the 3rd. So it's been almost three weeks since we've been playing the, with the card. And so I wanted to kind of get together and talk about any findings that people had questions about maybe bring up any new findings and then talk about observations from playing the last few weeks and also talk about pain points and maybe some solutions that can help people overcome those pain points. Hi Simone, welcome to this live stream. So for myself, I think um, the primary lesson learned at the moment, or I guess observation that I have, is that I am having to pick a hand early compared to two years ago. Now, last year was the first year that I felt that happen, where I felt like I needed to pick a hand early. And this year, it's the same way. And I just wonder if it's the change in the committee, that the players that happen to be part of that committee who are making these hands just by nature of the combinations are requiring you to commit to a hand earlier than years previous. Has anybody else felt that? Let me know in the comment section. I think that overall, that's really the only thing that that I have really observed. Everything else on the card, it just feels like the same game, just different flavor, you know? You're just having to work with different combinations, but I don't think there are any sort of oddities per se, other than the findings that I already listed out in that document and in the video. So it looks like a couple people have agreed that they're having to pick a hand early. So, and really, there's nothing wrong with that. It, it just is what it is. But you, if you could have to commit to a hand, you could find that you may need to switch to defense if your hand doesn't come in. That's really the result of that particular situation. You just have to either switch if you only have one exposure or if you have two expo exposures and you have no way to change your hand, you just have to switch to defense. Uh, let's see, Sharon says, you feel like after the Charleston, it's fairly clear what hand we're playing. So you feel like it's easier to build a hand going and you feel like you're in a place of strength going into the pick and discard phase of the game, which basically means that you're picking a hand or narrowing down to one or two options very early. I mean, the Charleston is in the begin game. So I think that kind of goes into the same concept as having to pick a hand early. You just have to make a decision early because of the combinations on the card. Hi, Dara. Is it Dara or Dara? Dara, pretty name. Okay, so yeah, I think a, a lot of people are feeling that, definitely. Um, let's see, so the there were several iterations of this card launch document. I think the first one was on, uh, let's see here. I don't remember the first published date that I had, but let me see if I can find the documents here real quick. Um, staging. Card launch, card three. Oh, here we go, PDFs. Okay, the first release of this document was on 330. 
The latest one was 416. So you, if you have an older document, look at the timestamp on the document. It has been updated because there were a few uh, things that I missed that I updated and there were um, some changes to this latest version. So look for 416 would be the date. And I added a footer. Oh, this one is not the right one. Let's see here, 411. The footer should say 416, but let me double check because my footer, let's see here, 331. Oh, there it is, 416. Hold on one second here. Yeah, April 16th. So that should be the latest and greatest. Okay, you're still waiting. Uh, M. Sherry, you're waiting for what? Let's see. Oh, you're, you're still waiting for your card? Okay. Let's see here. Let me catch up on chat. Okay, it rhymes with Sarah. Oh, that's okay, good. So I did pronounce it correctly, <laughs> Dara. Okay. Let's see, um, Simone says that she's only been playing for two years, so she can't tell the difference yet, but she likes to pick a hand. Yeah, that is a, a common uh, urge to pick a hand, but you really don't have to pick a hand till you run out of discards. Just saying. Okay, let's see, your group ordered the cards in March, and you are still waiting. Oh, wow. That's a long wait. Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, um, if you watch the video, there are a few spoilers in it, but it can prepare you for when you get the card. You might want to wait till you have your card and then watch it because you might um, not be able to fully digest the information. It's kind of nice to look at the stats and then kind of refer to the card for it to drill in. So I think that the, there are three, just to kind of recap, there are three common combinations on the card that are questioned every day by players. The first one is year number three, where you need to have a pair of flowers, two cons of dragons, and then the year tiles. So with the dragon, since there are only three of them, you need any two Kongs. It could be white dragons with a joker or a green dragon or a red dragon. It doesn't matter. Any two Kongs of dragons. It doesn't matter what suit the year is in. Any two Kongs of dragons can be used. So if you have 2019 in dots, you can have a, white, a Kong of white dragons with a joker. That's just fine. So that, that's the first one that has been causing some people to question the hand. The other one is consecutive run number five, where you need three flowers and then cons of two consecutive numbers and then a pung of a dragon, and that's all one suit. So the dragon has to correspond. In the parentheses, it says any one suit, and they they unintentionally omitted any two consecutive numbers or any run. So consecutive run, besides the very first combination, the blocks in those hands can start with any number as long as nine is the last number. So if you're playing a two number run, you can play eight, nine, but you can't play nine back to one. You can't do 9-1. You could do 8-9 and end at 9. So for the fifth hand down, any one suit, any two consecutive numbers. You can start with any number. It doesn't have to be 1 and 2. And that's true for every consecutive run hand, except the very first one where it says these numbers only in parentheses. You have two options, 1 through 5 or 5 through 9. Okay, then the last hand that has caused a lot of people to question the league oops is the seventh hand let's see six seven 
where you have a pung, a pair, and a pung in one suit. And then matching pungs for the middle number. And people have been asking, can the middle number, does the middle number have to be the pair? And the answer is yes. So for example, people were thinking that the pair could be the first block. So pair, pung, 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 pung. And then the pungs match the pair at the beginning. That's incorrect. It has to be pung, pair, pung, pung, pung. That is the convention. The pair, the pair is in the middle and the pungs match the pair. So I hope that that makes sense. Those are really the three hands that still today are creating questions in forums and on Facebook pages. And many posts go round and round trying to figure it out. But each one of these have been confirmed by the league. So you can always go to the league's website and let me see if I can find the page because they do publish any uh, FAQs for the latest card. Let's see. Let me see if I can tell you where to go. Store charities, the game, FAQs. Okay, it's on the FAQ page. I will put a link to this in the video description. So if you have any questions, they will answer any of these problematic hands. They'll answer it on that page. So I will put this in the video description below. Okay, we might have to wait until after the stream for you to see it, but it's basically their FAQ page. So if you just go to the National Mahjong League web, website and click on FAQs, you'll find it. Okay, so let me catch up with the chat here. Okay, you're just joining. Welcome, Paula. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about my findings or do you have any additional findings or maybe share about some of the pain points that you're having with this year's card and let's try to come up with some solutions and i will just monitor chat so every time i look to the side i'm looking at chat we'll see if we can help some people out here in this live stream And I am, all the videos after April 1st are using the new card. And even in some of these videos, I've made mistakes. So even advanced players are on the learning curve and will make mistakes. It, the conventions are varied on this card. So if you don't check the convention, you could have a, a bad shape of your hand and find yourself in a, some trouble. And that actually happened to me. I had to redo a video because I used the wrong convention. I basically combined a hand from last year to a hand from this year. And I didn't see it until the video was published. So I had to quickly redo the video. So we're all on a learning curve. Every year when the new card comes out, we're on a learning curve. Okay, Katie says, uh, what do you call the hand convention for hand number five under evens? Hand number five under evens is called a pyramid. Pair, pung, kong, pung, pair, because it goes up and down like a pyramid. And incidentally, or in the early days of the league, there were hands in a category called pyramids. There was actually a category called pyramids. Uh, Ruth says, it's nice to see pungs of flowers and dragons, which are easier to get with a joker or two. Yep, I agree. I, I think that flowers are definitely easier to get with the card, but they are still prevalent and there are many with pairs. Let's see, the hands with flowers, 
There are four less hands with flowers overall this year compared to last year. And there are five less with hands using pairs of flowers this year. And there are no double pungs of flowers. So flowers should be easier to get, but I find that I still struggle getting a flower when I need it. It's like you, you get them when you don't need them, and when you, when you don't need them, you get them. Kind of like winds. The same thing happens with winds and dragons. Flowers, winds, and dragons. Okay, Marnie says, I find my picked hand goes dead very quickly when trying for pairs. Then changing hands is difficult. Okay, for playing pair hands, you just have to switch to the category that relates to that particular hand. Every one, and you might already know this, but some people may not have, have realized it. I mean, if you look at it closely, it, it's all there. Um, but some people may not have connected it, but each one of the hands in the singles and pairs category relate to a category on the card. So whichever pair hand you're playing, just switch to the category. For example, the first hand under the single and pair category is news with like numbers. So you could switch to a news hand in Winds and Dragons, or if you start getting pungs of your like numbers, you can maybe switch to a like number hand. The next hand down is evens. After that is odds. And you have little odds or big odds. So you can switch to whichever one you have the most tiles for, big or little. Then the next one is consecutive run. After that is three, six, nine. After that is consecutive run again. There are two consecutive run hands. So you could switch to consecutive run with two of the pair hands. And then finally we have the year hand. So that year hand could go to the year category Let's see, and also because 2019 is a repeating pattern, you might even be able to switch to like numbers. Okay, let's see. Um, someone, uh, Carol asked, can you explain the, the, the term convention? The term convention is basically, um, it's, it, it defines the shape of a hand. So if you look at the card, there are groups of letters and numbers. So you have four flowers, for example, denoted in the letter F, and then you have a space. And then you have 2019. I'm using the first hand under the year category. So 2019 after the space. Then you have another space with a pung of ones, and a space, and then a pung of nines. So we have here a com, and then a block of singles, and then a pung, and a pung. So that is a convention. They're using a convention. Com, block of singles, pung, pung. Now, because they're using a block of singles, that is not going to be a repeating convention because it's fairly unique because of the year. But if you look at, let's say, the second hand under consecutive run, you have two suits. You've got four blocks, Pung, pe, uh, Pung Kong, Pung Kong. That's the convention, Pung Kong, Pung Kong. It defines the shape of the hand. So that, that convention, Pung Kong, Pung Kong, is elsewhere on the card in different categories. If you look at the second hand down, two, four, six, eight, Pung Kong, Pung Kong. It's the same shape, the same convention. I hope that helps. Okay, uh, Sharon says, you find it difficult to get pairs also unless I get them right off the bat. I have been finding that as well. Yes, I have been finding that as well. And it may just be the particular combinations on this card are creating kind of a horde result. You know, people are hoarding tiles to make their hand, making it difficult for other hands to complete. So we'll just have to wait and see year after year what's happening here. But I have found that, number one, I have to pick a hand early. I have a hard time getting flowers. 
And if my pairs are not secured, I also have a hard time with that. But if you are early, if you're set early in the game, in the begin game, or even maybe um, the before the middle of the third wall, let's say, if you're set and you still, you're waiting on a pair, I would play it that way. I would not discard a tile from a pung um, and hope for a joker or something like that. I would play to win on a pair. So it really just depends on what's happening at the table. You just have to be mindful of the exposures and you need to scout the discards and just be very uh, aware of what is being discarded, what is being exposed to help you make the right decisions at the right time. Because before you make two exposures, let's say, you're not committing to where you need a pair and it's gone dead. Uh, let's see if we can, uh, let's see, the hand seems like other, okay, now let me catch back up. Okay, Donna, I'm catching up here with comments. Do you find that, uh-oh, okay, do you find that with the new hands, it seems like other players are one tile away from Mahjong, someone calls Mahjong, yep, one tile Tony, but I think that's true with every card. I think it just really depends on the skill skill level at the table, the right people making the right decisions at the right time to get ready early um, or to get ready and then everyone kind of is at a ready state at, at about the same time. I think it's really situational, but I don't think it's because of the, the card this year per se. Okay, Paula says, I'm finding that Mahjongs are coming quicker this year uh, and there are fewer wall games. Okay, I can't personally speak to that. Everybody in the room, if you can speak to that, are you finding that to be the case? I've only played live once and I've only played online a few times, and I'm not seeing any any difference at the moment. Okay, let's see. We have Christine, new to the game, but picking up lots of tips from you. Excellent, Christine. Glad to hear it. Oh, explain Joker Bait. Okay, I have three videos on Joker Bait, and I believe that I have a link to Joker Bait in every National Mahjong League exercise video because... Joker bait comes up in almost every single video. Um, basically, it is a term coined by Tom Sloper, and he has a huge blog of uh, FAQs and history about the game, etc. It, it's um, jam packed with information. So he coined the term Joker bait, and basically, what it means is that if you have a pair, for example, let's say a pair that you do not need. And you're going through the Charleston, you hold that pair because you have discards that you can get rid of. And then at the end of the Charleston, you hold on to that pair, even though you don't need it. And then later in the game, you discard one to coax an exposure from an opponent with a joker. And then on your next turn, you use that second tile to exchange the joker. It doesn't always work. It's kind of hit or miss. If you do play with joker bait, you need to be mindful to get rid of it by the end of the third wall, especially if they are fresh tiles. You do not want to be holding joker bait or fresh tiles when you're in the fourth wall because that is when people are going to be set with their hand or getting ready to win. And if you discard a fresh tile in the fourth wall, you could be dealing into a mahjong at that point. So I hope that helps answer the question about Joker Bait. Jane says, uh, hi from California on the other coast. Very nice. Um, you'd like to analyze the card for how many hands can be made with each number. Wow, that's a huge task. You count 25 times that fives are used. Six can be used 25 hands too. So avoid passing both. And incidentally, uh, Jane, those two numbers, and even a four, four, five, six, and five in particular, this this kind of is common in all Mahjong, actually, no matter what the version. But four, five, six are in the middle of the nine tile sequence. So when you're playing consecutive run hands, it's highly likely that four, five, and six are going to be in a couple of hands. If two people are playing consecutive run, four, five, and six will most likely be in those 
hands because they're in the middle of the nine tile range and fives in particular are in the middle of that range. In this year, fives are prevalent because they're in every hand of the addition category. And then every year in the odds category, we have one, three, five, five, seven, nine, and we have little odds and big odds. Little odds, one, three, five, and big odds, five, seven, nine, share the five. So if you have a player playing little odds and a player playing big odds, they're going to be fighting for those fives. If you have a player playing addition, little odds and big odds, Fives are going to be really hard to come by. But yeah, that's a really great observation, Jane. Thanks for that. Carlene says, you agree that Mahjong seems to be coming uh, early in the game, okay? Uh, Diane says, your group is getting a lot of wall games. You all play very defensively. Yep, yeah, that is definitely a, a common occurrence when you have very defensive players. You will have a lot of wall games because people are sabotaging their own hand in order to not deal into a mahjong. So that, that's common. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, Jane says sevens can be used in 19 different hands, fours can only be used in 13. Okay, well that's, that is interesting. Um, sevens, let's see, why might that be? I don't know why that might be because I don't see sevens as being as prevalent, um, but definitely fives. And I, I heard back from many players concurring with that. Okay, Mary says, I haven't played much yet because I just received the card and I'm noticing that fives are an issue. Yep. Many hands require, requiring Kongs of fives. Yes. So if you're playing a pair hand, for example, the odd pair hand, third one down, you better make sure that you have your pairs secured, even your singles, before you commit to that hand. You may have trouble. But you can always transition to the odd category. Robin says, I'm finding a need to pass like numbers a lot during the Charleston this year in order to keep my hand intact. Okay, this is very situational, but passing like numbers is very risky. It's almost as risky as passing a pair. I try rarely to do it. If my hand is set, or if I'm ready on a heavenly hand, let's say, I might pass like numbers. I might pass a flower and I might pass a white dragon. But if, if my hand has a gap, or if I am not set uh, and I have work to do, I will I will, oh, and if I have lots of options, I'll whittle down my options before I pass like numbers. Because if somebody is playing like numbers with those tiles, you will fit right into their hand. So just be cautious when you're passing like numbers. It's, it's not a right or wrong thing, but there is risk. And I think that's where the caution needs to be heated there. Uh, Chris says, quints are a lot easier this year since they don't need to be quints in the hand. Let's see. Since, since many don't need to be quints. Oh, oh, I see. Let's see. We have hand. the first hand has one quint. The second hand has two. The third has two. And the fourth has two. So let's see here. Let me see if I can find last year's card. There it is. Okay. Two, 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 two. Okay, so that's an interesting observation, Chris. I'm going to add that to my findings uh, list for next year or for the statistics list. Last year there were four quints, and all four of them had two quints. So really it's one hand, the very first one, that has only one quint. So that particular quint, probably is going to be pretty easy. I mean, if you think about it, it's identical or nearly identical to the very first consecutive run hand. If you pair up and get a lot of jokers while you're playing that first consecutive run hand, one through five, you can easily switch to the quint if you're not already committed with exposures. Okay, Paula says, did the National Mahjong League change the rule for when two people need a tile for an exposure 
for a mahjong, the first player to call or expose gets it, and not the next in line to the discarder. Okay, this has caused a lot of controversy, and the interesting thing is, is it's not a new ruling from what I have read on Sloperama. Uh, this is on a, I believe, a 2013 post, I believe is what it was. I'll have to double check what when that post was. Uh, 2013 when they clarified this ruling I'm going to add that to my list of things to look into but basically the only time that the tile according to the league okay the only time that the tile that is discarded is claimed claimed by two people is when the player to the right of the discarder, or really any discarder, because if it's for a pung, anybody can discard it. So let's say, no, okay, if anybody wants a discarded tile, whoever is closest to the discarder is eligible for that tile, unless another player also wants the tile and they expose their tiles from their rack before the player closest to the discarder says that they want it. That's the kicker. And the problem here or the, the tendency with this rule is going to be that it will foster an aggressive playing environment because people will be aggressive with their exposures. They'll slap them up there and maybe not even say anything, just get their tiles out there as quick as they can. It, it's, it's really going to promote, I think, some potential or potentially promote poor sportsmanship. So in some groups, they're ignoring that rule. And it's gonna be up to your own group in my game, in my personal game, I am going to ignore that rule. The player closest to the discarder will get the tile. If the player makes an exposure and the, the player closer to the discarder says, wait, I want that tile, you know, I, I just think that in every other version of Mahjong, whoever is closer to the discarder gets the tile. So for continuity, I believe that that person is eligible for the tile. And the person who put up their exposure out of turn, let's say, should have paused to be to give that other player a moment to decide if they wanted the tile. This kind of goes along with the idea of counting to three in your head before picking your tile. Have you ever played with a quick picker? Somebody who reaches out or puts their hand like halfway in the table or touches the tile in the wall, ready to pick it, or even picks the tile early, not looking at it, and then once the tile from the player on their left discards, they quickly look at it and then move along. Okay, those quick pickers or, or pick in advance or um, playing with a future type situations, that gives the, the, the window of opportunity um, is shortened for the player to the to the right of the discarder, and to me, it just promotes poor sportsmanship. That's just my opinion. Okay, I know I, I was a little wordy on those, so I apologize for that. Uh, let's see. Anak says, "Doesn't claiming for mahjong take priority over taking a towel for a pung or a con?" Yes, absolutely. This the. The simultaneous call is for ex an exposure, not Mahjong. Um, and if Mahjong is declared by two players, the player closest to the discarder gets that tile. And that's why it is a conflict to me, because to me it's a contradiction. A contradiction is the better word. If the player, if there are two people ready to win on one tile, the player to, to closest to the discarder gets the tile, so why wouldn't that be the same logic for an exposure? Let me know what you guys think about that. 
Uh, Chris says singles in Paris consecutive run is very hard. Seven numbers. You're almost afraid to try it. Uh, now, what's interesting is that seven, uh, seven consecutive numbers, pairs of seven consecutive numbers, it is very difficult, very, very difficult. And incidentally, that is a hand on Mahjong competition rules. And let's see. Oh, I don't have my, uh, hold on one second. That is one of the hands on Mahjong competition rules. Let's see if I can uh, pull it up because I want to tell you how many points it's worth. Okay, uh, Chris says that her favorite hand is 1-2 Dragon, the singles and pair hand. That is a very pretty hand. It kind of reminds me of the 2019 pair hand with matching dragons, which is also very pretty. Yeah, I think that's a pretty hand too. Uh, let me see here. Let me open up my... MCR card because I thought that was kind of interesting that there was actually an MCR hand on the card this year. I'm still waiting for 13 orphans to get on this card. I have submitted it for consideration but have yet to see it on the card. 13 orphans is would be a fabulous hand for American Mahjong in my opinion. Okay, and I'll explain what that is if anybody is interested. Okay, so seven unique pairs, seven numbers in a sequence. Oops. Oh. oh, shoot. Oh, okay, there we go. Seven. Oh, I thought it was. Hold on one second. Seven pairs. Oh, there it is. Seven unique pairs, seven shifted pairs, seven pairs in a sequence in one suit. 88 points. That's the highest scoring hand you can get in MCR. One of them. Okay. Okay, so let me explain 13 Orphans and why I think it would be a great hand on the card. It is, it only has one pair. Everything else is a single tile. It's ones and nines of each suit, one of each Wind and Dragon, and any tile paired. Any tile. Ones and nines of each suit, one of each wind and dragon, and any tile paired. That's called 13 Orphans. In Wright, Pat Wright Patterson Mahjong, it's called Angels. So that particular pair hand is shared. And, it, and uh, 13 Orphans in, is in most uh, Asian versions. Hong Kong Mahjong. I don't know if it's in Taiwanese or Singaporean, but I know it's in Hong Kong Mahjong, MCR, Ricci, and Wright Patterson Mahjong. Uh, let's see, Alieska says there have been many times this year you could have won with that hand. Uh, let's see, are you talking about 13 orphans or are you talking about the seven consecutive pairs? Okay, I'm going to look at the card uh, real quick. We have 15 minutes to go. Let's see here. So if anybody has any pain points, put them in now so we can cover them. I'm just looking at the card to see if I've had any trouble spots myself. Let's see here. I still need to force myself to make the addition hands. If I don't have four flowers, I just don't go for addition. If I have three flowers, I might go for addition. Uh, let's see. I think the third quint would be hard. Two pairs and two quints. I think that's that's a 45-point hand. So I think that it is valued correctly. That That's a hard hand. I haven't gotten that yet. I don't even think I have tried it. Oh, you've been ready on 13 orphans. Oh, that is a great hand. I love it. Okay, let me look here at the... Um, I really don't think that I have had any problems other than bonehead things like having the wrong convention in a video. Um,
I really don't think there are any other problems other than the ones that were identified in that card launch document. And if you're joining the live stream late, there's a link below the video to this document, which has a bunch of statistics and some findings for the new card compared to last year. And then there's also a video that you could watch if you're interested. Uh, let's see, Paula says, you like the addition hands last year, but it's so difficult to get fives this year that I haven't been able to get it. The other challenge with the addition hands this year is that the, the sum of the formula is different for every hand, 11, 12, and 13. So you really have to be on your toes to make sure that you are mathematically correct, as it were, for the addition category. The numbers are different, 11, 12, and 13. I think one time I said 5, 6, 12, or something like that. Let's see, what was last year's? I think I was kind of combining last year's sum to this year's. So, um, yeah, I had to do a little editing on that. Because when I looked at the card, I'm, I'm thinking, no, 5 plus 6 is 11. Uh, Anak says, I got caught by that addition hand change. Oh, with the, the uh, sum being different for each hand, 5 plus 6 is 11. 5 plus 7 is 12. 5 plus 8 is 13. They were being very clever this year with the addition category. Usually it is 7, 11. Lucky 13, and then last year, 12. So they're really, you know, trying to freshen things up and picking some different combinations. On the mock card, when I made the mock card for my lessons, I picked 10. The addition hand would be 10, so that would be a challenge to make year hands anytime there's a zero, of course. All right, let's see. Robin says, 2018 was your first card, and, and you think that you were a beginner. It was beginner-friendly, or maybe it's just that I'm not giving myself the time to learn the new card. I think that's it, because everybody goes through a learning curve with the new card, even advanced players. I, I am playing live once a month, and I play online maybe twice a week, two or three times a week. And... It usually takes me about a month to get used to the new card. And I think it just really depends on how often you play. The more you play, the more comfortable you're going to be. And the shorter your learning curve because you are you have a concentrated opportunity. You know, the more games you play, the more comfortable you are navigating the card. Alieska, I don't, I don't think they've had subtraction hands for many, many years. Let's see. But I think they were on the card at one time. Let me just look. I can't readily identify it, but, okay, yeah, I don't, I've not seen subtraction hands on the card, and I've been playing since 1990, and it's always been addition. Has anybody, does anybody remember there being a subtraction category instead of addition? I'm just looking over my stats really quick just to see. I have to watch my own video to remind myself of what I thought was kind of astonishing. I still think that like numbers are, are a critical thing to uh, think about during the Charleston and not passing like numbers. I still, I have deep convictions about that. I really believe that passing like numbers is almost as risky as passing pairs. And that holds true to this year. 
There are 38% of, of the hands on the card use like numbers. Six more than last year. That's significant. Uh, let's see. Uh, Christine asks, how was I introduced to the game? For American Mahjong, using the card, my mom taught me. My mom learned to play Wright-Patterson Mahjong, which uses the green book. Can you see the green book? This is the green book. If you ever see any of my Wright-Patterson videos, this is the green book where all the Wright-Patterson hands are. We learned that in 1973. So that is the version I grew up on. And then in 1990, my mom's group started playing American Mahjong using the National Mahjong League card, and she was fired up about it. She loved it. And I think because it was a nice change of pace from playing Wright Pat since 1973. So it was just something fresh and new. So she really loved it and taught me how to play. So I started playing National Mahjong League rules in 1990. And then uh, in, at about that same time is when I started having meetups and I was in, I had uh, other Mahjong players come and I learned how to play Cantonese style, Hong Kong Mahjong. And then um, when we moved here in 2006, 2008, um, shortly after we moved here, I learned how to play uh, Singaporean from someone in our group. I learned how to play also Ricci Mahjong. And then lately in the last six months, six to nine months, I'd say one of the groups that I was playing with occasionally started playing Mahjong competition rules. So, you know, the more people in your sphere of influence who play Mahjong, the more versions you're going to hear about and see and maybe even want to learn. And they're all fascinating. They all have pluses and minuses. They all have um, their own special nuances for the game. And... You know, some are more respected than others, but I think they all should have equal respect. They're all challenging, and they are all a lot of fun to play. Some are more sophisticated than others, though. I must say that. Uh, let's see here. So let me see if I missed anything here. Okay, Chris said maybe in the 2004, um, two, in 2468, category was multiplication two four six eight I don't understand okay gotta go Alieska says she's got to go yep we've got about uh, seven more minutes so if you all have any anything more to talk about with the card write it in the comment section now we'll try to answer or help out if you have any questions no question is a bad question there are no dumb questions that's how the saying goes there are no dumb questions any question could be asked because this is a complex game. And some people who have played uh, other versions think that they could just sit down and play American Mahjong in one sitting, and that's just not the case. It's complex. Uh, Ruth says, why do they put flowers in the middle of 369 on the card, not at the beginning like everywhere else? You have to look twice. Usually the flowers are going to be in the middle when it's in a pyramid convention. Or shape pair pung kong pung pair and they're just trying to be aesthetically pleasing that's why and somebody else had asked let's see I had another question today hold on one second there was another question from somebody right here hold on one second Why is the knitted 369 dragon hand written in green and blue, but all the other two suit hands on the card are green and red? And my answer to that is that the National Mahjong League is not consistent with formatting. They need somebody with an admin skills and OCD on their team. That's my honest opinion. I think it would be really helpful to have an admin and somebody with OCD on their team. Or maybe have an admin or somebody with OCD proofread or edit the card before it goes to production. Uh, Christine says that she played last week with eight newbies. 
One player picked a closed hand unknowingly and grabbed a discard. Is that player automatically out of the game? Hope that makes sense. Yes, it does. But let me ask you a question. They grabbed the tile, but did they make an exposure? They grabbed the tile. Let's see here. The league says that if a player touches a tile and it moves, they need to take it because it shows intent. If you are playing with new players, I think that there should be grace to a point. So if they were all newbies and she changed her mind, I would let it go. Now, my question is, did she make an exposure? Uh, Rue says, is, is at beginning in consecutive run? I don't know. Okay, yes, they exposed. Okay, if... If a player makes an exposure, they have to take the discard and complete that exposure, and they gotta make it work. That's in the rules. It's in this book, Mahjong Made Easy. I, I would highly recommend everybody, at least one person in your group should have this book. It's inexpensive, and you can get it in the league store. There's a link below the video to their store. This is, um, I don't know, maybe the fifth line item down on their product list. And it was recently published. And it's going to have a lot of the rules of the game and then FAQ, some strategy, and a little bit on variations. But if you are having a debate in your group, you could refer to that to hopefully answer any questions that may come up. Yeah, I, I don't know where that particular rule is. It's going to be in the beginning of the of the book, though, when it starts talking about an exposure. Let's see. I mean, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time looking through that to try to find it, but it is in there. If a player makes an exposure, they are committed to taking that discard. Now, if you are playing with new players, I give them grace and let and back up the game because it, we, we all started at that same place. But, you know, after somebody's been playing a month, they need to um, take off the training wheels and play by the rules and not have as much grace because you can also learn from failure. All right, any other questions about the card or concerns, pain points? We are about at our one hour mark for the live stream. Anak says, when you put together, when you put together a fake Charleston for, three, for a three player game, do you take the jokers out of the Charleston tiles and put them in the other three walls, if that makes sense? It does make sense. Uh, Ruth, I'll get to your your question, your comment there in just a second. When the league says when you play three, you're supposed to omit the Charleston. So let me just make that abundantly clear first, because this causes a lot of ruckus with purists, people who play by the rules. Omit the Charleston when you play three. But if your group decides to play with three players and the Charleston then there are several ways that you can set it up. And there are different rules that you can apply in regards to jokers. And I do have a video on this, by the way, that talks about all this. I think look for uh, three player options in my channel. But basically, you can set up th uh, three tiles, six rows deep for the Charleston, and then Anybody who picks up a joker will randomly exchange it from a tile in the wall or the group decides that they can keep it. Those are the two ways that I've seen it done. And it's just a matter of the group making that decision and then you just play by the group decision. Okay, uh, Ruth says, You're I am still talking about flowers in the middle of the hand on the card. Okay. The... Um, Let's see, I see that in 
one area of the card so far. Let me just look. Flowers are in the middle of the 369 hand, fifth one down. And I believe last year the double pung flowers were in the middle of the hand too. But I think that they're just trying to be creative. I, I don't think there's any other, I can't think of any other reason for them to do it that way. I mean, they surely could have put four flowers and then pung, or pear, pung, pear, or let's see, it would have been pear, pung, pung, pear, but they're using the pyramid convention, pear, pung, kong, pung, pear. So that's why the flowers aren't in the middle for that particular hand. They just decided to format it that way. Okay, see Paula's question. Pa um, oh, pyramid. Okay, good, Ruth. Um, she was just saying that she sees what it means now about the pyramid shape. Okay, so Paula's question. I haven't tried a single or pair hand yet. Any hints on why to try for one? For example, how many discards after the Charleston should you have for a single and pair hand? Okay, uh, when I do the Charleston, for me, it doesn't matter what kind of hand I'm playing. My goal is to have four discards or less, whether it's a single and pair hand or not. Four discards or less. That is a strong start going into the pick and discard phase of the game. What you have to pay attention to is exposures and discards. You've got to be mindful of single discards going down and then blocks of tiles being exposed that you might need because you may have to abandon your pair hand and switch to the related category for your single and pair hand. I hope that answers the question. I, uh, when, when I get my drawn tiles, if I have a joker, I will most not likely not play a pair hand. I'll try to leverage the joker. But if I have no gaps for a single and pair and I have pairs in there, I might sacrifice one joker. If I draw another joker, I'll abandon the pair hand and leverage those jokers. The nice thing about playing a pair hand is that you're concealed, so you have great flexibility in switching your hand. So for playing a pair hand, or any concealed hand for that matter, you have greater flexibility than you do playing a hand with an exposure. Once you start making exposures, the more exposures you have, the more committed you are to the hand. If you are concealed, you have greater flexibility, and you can move all over the card including a pair hand. All right, we have gone an hour talking about the new card. I hope that the comments and um, review of the findings from the card launch have helped and the discussions about the pain points this year so far. I think it's a great card. And I think every year is a great card, actually. I, I don't dislike any particular year. I think they're all very challenging. And maybe as time goes on, there may be more findings. I don't know. But um, I think I have personally settled into the card just fine. How about everybody else? Is everyone feeling good about the card other than the things that we talked about tonight? You're very welcome. I hope that it helped. And... You know, if, if you guys want to have more of these table talks, let me know in the chat. We've had about 50 in attendance, and so it, it's it been great having you all here with me to talk about the new card. I enjoyed it very much. I love the camaraderie and the company. It's a work in progress. I agree. Oh, Diane, great. First live chat. Excellent. Yeah, this is kind of a talking head live chat. It's a, I call it table talk because we just talk. You know, there's no tiles, no games, no game with gaming with commentary or anything like that. All we do is talk, talk about Mahjong. Oh, Ruth, thank you. Oh, joining late. Hi, Bridget. This definitely will be recorded and posted afterwards. So you're welcome to watch the repost that'll be up tomorrow. Uh, Leslie says you're looking, still waiting for your card in Canada. Oh man, that is painful. 
but you will get it sooner rather than, than later. Let's hope, fingers crossed. And when you do, watch my card launch video so that you can have a shorter learning curve than everybody else. <laughs> Maybe get an advantage at the table, as it were. All right, everybody, I think I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you all for giving such great input. Thank you for your questions, comments, and, of course, your continued support for my channel. Thank you for watching, commenting, and for sharing. We're at, I believe, almost 6,500 subscribers now, and when we get to 10,000 subscribers, I want to do something special. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I've been thinking about it, but I would like to do something special when the channel hits 10,000 subscribers. So please share about the channel with all your friends so that we can grow the community together. The more the merrier. We can share the wealth of knowledge and help everybody grow and learn this great game and get become more and more comfortable with it. The more comfortable we are with the game, the more fun we can have. So if you haven't subscribed to my channel, consider subscribing. Click that little gray bell if you do. That way you'll get notification for when I post new videos and you won't miss an opportunity to learn a new strategy or pick up an insight to the game that could give you an advantage at the table. Between now and the next Table Talk, may all your picks be keepers.